Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 11th of February and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 14th of February with me Michael Hewson. And it's certainly been a week for numbers this week. We've seen some good earnings, we've seen some bad earnings, we've seen um, inflation numbers that have come in above expectations and we've seen a market reaction that initially saw markets trend higher in the first part of the week. And as we head into the weekend, we're seeing markets that are spooked by a very high um, US CPI reading for January. So as we look ahead to the upcoming week, the focus is going to remain on inflation, um, particularly with respect to UK CPI. We've also got a whole host of other data out of the UK in the coming week namely unemployment, wages, and retail sales, um, as well as the latest Fed minutes. And the Fed minutes are particularly topical, um, but they're also going to be dated, given the fact that they happened before uh, this week's uh, US CPI reading, which um, was, how should we say, a little bit of a surprise to the upside. Um, for most of this week, we saw US markets sort of trending higher on an expectation that we might see US inflation, US inflation might be slowing. Um, you know, we can, we can sort of see that play out in the early part of this week with a slow move higher. Now, obviously, this is the move post CPI, and this is where we are currently now, above the 200-day moving average on the S&P 500. And it's interesting to note that the rally that we saw um, in the early part of this week ran into problems at around about the 4595, 40,600 level. So that's gonna be a key level. And even though we've seen yields spike quite significantly over the course of the past 24 hours, we can see that played out here in this spread chart that I've done between the US 10 year and the US two year. So the 10 year is a 199.62, um, hit 2% yesterday, went up to as high as 205. It has since come back. Um, we've also got the US two year, which is currently at 158.57. It went above 160 yesterday and has since slipped back. And of course, what we've also seen is a narrowing of the yield curve. Um, we've seen a sharp narrowing of interest rate differentials between the 10-year and the two-year over the course of the past few months. And that's reflected in this down channel here. Now, an awful lot of people have suggested that if the yield curve flattens and potentially goes inverted, like it did back in 2019, that's a signal of recession. Well, we weren't in recession in 2019. So sometimes the yield curve inverting doesn't necessarily mean that we're heading towards recession. What is essentially, I think, reflecting is concern that the Fed might react too aggressively to yesterday's numbers. Now, depending on who you talk to, um, you know, the inflation is either transitory or it isn't. The ECB think that inflation is transitory. It's interesting to note that this week, ECB President Christine Lagarde dialed back some of her hawkishness from last week's press conference when she said that a rate rise was, well, when she refused to repeat her comments in December, that a rate rise was unlikely in 2022. Nonetheless, we've seen the European Union downgrade their economic growth forecasts for this year, um, as well as revising upward their inflation forecasts. But they still seem to be of the opinion that inflation is likely to be more transitory than not, and that there's no comparison when compared to the US economy. And certainly I think in terms of the GDP numbers, she's probably right. But as I said in my video last week, inflation is anything but transitory, certainly by the looks of some of the inflation prints that we're seeing in some parts of the Euro area. Baltic states, for example, CPI is above 10%. France, it's at 3.8, and yet somehow 
the ECB thinks that miraculously um, inflation will fall, fall back to the 2% target um, in the early part of next year. Well, I guess we shall see without them doing anything. Well, bond markets certainly aren't reflecting the fact that the ECB is going to do nothing this year. Um, and even though we've had some dovish commentary coming out from various other ECB policy makers, I think that's more of an attempt to try and cap the rise in peripheral yields than it is any expectation that we won't see a rate hike from the ECB this year. And let's not forget they're at minus 50 basis points. So um, that I think is the, um, the, the key thing that I'm looking at over the course of the next few days. Um, what was particularly interesting, I think, with respect to yesterday's CPI numbers, which was a 40 year high for the US, was that the core prices, the core prices tipped the scales at 6%. So that's stripping out food and energy, which is obviously the hottest components. If you actually look at the numbers internally, away from used car and petrol prices, which were both up 40% year to date, we still saw double digit price rises in domestic gas, meat, dairy, fish, and fruit. So it rather begs the question is why the Fed is still adding to its balance sheet even now. You heard talk um, on Thursday of Bullard saying that maybe they should have an emergency rate meeting to hike rates before the 16th of March, which is when they're due to have the next policy decision. I mean, really? Is he serious? I mean, that suggests to me that he's been spooked by those inflation numbers, seven and a half percent. Um, you know, what's it going to change? You know, we are now heading into the 14th of February, um, the week beginning of the 14th of February, and he's talking about emergency rate hike. Why don't you just telegraph to the markets that you're absolutely terrified of what's going on? It's not particularly helpful. And you'd have to stop QE as well. And seeing as QE is ending in March anyway, what would the point be of basically hiking rates by 50 basis points or 25 basis points four weeks before you're going to do so anyway? So I think we can basically draw a line under any prospect whatsoever that the Fed will call an emergency rate meeting and do an emergency rate hike. I think that's highly unlikely um, because it would, send the, it would send the message that the central bank is panicking. And I don't think that's a message they really want to be sending, not to the markets anyway, not to anybody for that matter. So the S&P 200 day moving average, these lows here are likely to be very important when US markets open later today. What was particularly notable um, was the 200 day moving average on the NASDAQ, which held quite nicely. But again, you see, we've seen, very, we've seen some very decent up moves this week, but again, we've run foul of that 15,000 level. So again, this is the key level on the upside for the NASDAQ, um, coinciding with those key levels that I outlined on the S&P 500. For me, if we're going to see further gains on US markets, we need to break that top there. Um, otherwise, there is a risk that we could break towards the downside and revisit the January lows. Now, I have been impressed by the resilience of US markets relative to concerns about um, high levels of inflation. And I think that's just the markets are starting to get used to the idea that rates are going to have to rise. And, and ultimately, some of what we've seen this week with respect to earnings actually has, hasn't been too bad. You look at the unemployment numbers, the unemployment numbers are still very, very low. And I know there are concerns about unemployment going up. Well, it could well go up, but you need to work through the vacancies first. Um, 10 million in the US, 1 million in the UK. So I think it's unlikely that unemployment will start to go up, given the number of vacancies currently available in the, in, in the US and UK economy. Now, of course, those vacancies could disappear. But at the moment, they are still there. And um, we've got UK data coming up in the next few days, which should give us an indication of the health of the UK labour market. Um, FTSE 100 has had a fairly decent week this week. Once again, trending higher, made another two and a half year, two, two year high earlier today. Well on course for my target of 7,800. Um, and again, once again, very much a case of buy the dips, higher lows, higher highs, 
we have seen a little bit of a pullback today, but, but overall, you know, while we're still in this uptrend, we remain very much a case of buy the dip. Now we could slip back down. Certainly we did that the last time that we saw that here. We could well see a similar fallback to 7,400, but overall, I still remain broadly positive on the FTSE 100. And I see no reason to change that. And perversely, if you get if you get significant further weakness in US markets, that could actually see capital flows move into Europe and the UK because they're much cheaper markets relative to the more overvalued areas within the US. So you could see money come out of the US and come into Europe and the UK where the stock valuations are much and company valuations are much more realistic. Um, so again. DAX here, same old, same old, we're in a range. I really don't see that changing. The big support level is in and around 15,000. So definitely going to keep keep an eye on that going forward. So looking at the data, and it's very much a UK centric week as we look ahead. We've got UK unemployment and average earnings on the 15th of February. And that fell back to its lowest level, unemployment fell back to its lowest level since July 2020 in the three months to November, um, falling to 4.1%. The biggest problem here is the lacklustre wage growth that we've been seeing. And that contrasts with the much more positive wage growth that we've been seeing in the US. Wage growth in the US is at 5.7%. I mean, it's still below the inflation rate of 75 but nonetheless, it is at a much higher level and it's rising. It went up from 4.9 to 5.7. So it's going in the right direction. The biggest concern in the UK is that wage growth is falling. And that is, an, that is a trend that we really need to see some evidence of a change in, given the fact that we've got um, potential um, tax rises coming in April. Um, everyone is feeling the pinch at the moment. Companies are being able to pass on price rises, but that may not continue to be the case as we head into March, April and May. So certainly we'll be keeping an eye out on for evidence of a bottoming in the decline that we've been seeing in wages and real wages are declining at the moment relative to inflation. Um, but certainly in December, the number of vacancies increased rising to 1.25 million but the labor force is a little bit smaller than it was pre-pandemic. So that will be significant. It'll be significant in terms of retail sales, which are due out on Friday, the 18th. And in the wake of the government's rollout of Plan B restrictions in December, we saw a massive slump in retail sales, minus 3.6%, but it didn't have a big effect on fourth quarter GDP. We still saw a 1% expansion in fourth quarter GDP in the numbers that were released this morning. More importantly, manufacturing held up fairly well as did construction. So the hope is that we'll see a little bit of a rebound in UK retail sales um, for January. Certainly, I think in terms of the numbers that we saw from the British Retail Consortium earlier this week, that we did see a little bit of a rebound on the back of sales of homeware and electronics. Food sales did slip back, but you would expect that given the fact that food sales, food sales would have picked up leading into Christmas and New Year. And so that would be you know, a perfectly normal state of affairs. So the expectation is for UK retail sales to see a, see a rebound of around about 0.9% for January. However, with consumer confidence still remaining fairly fragile. Obviously, you've got rising prices in the shops um, as well, which is likely to constrain um, incomes. Um, that, that, is, that is potentially going to act as a little bit of a break on spending as we head towards the end of the tax year. CPI. CPI, I think, is going to be the hot button issue for this week because it could give us a forward indication of what the Bank of England might decide to do in March, given the fact that four MPC members voted for 50 basis points 
at the last meeting rather than the 25 that we actually got. So a really strong reading here could actually tip the scales for a potential another 25 basis points in March. And certainly if you look at the UK two-year gilt, um, markets are pricing in quite a bit more than that over the course of the next year or so. The UK two-year gilt yield is at a 10-year high. It's a 10-year high. So certainly I think there, the markets are pricing in quite an aggressive um, pace of tightening. Now, whether or not we get that is another matter, but certainly I think in terms of where the gilt yield is, we're certainly looking at at least another 1%, um, which to my mind seems a little bit much. Just, to re just as a reminder, the base rate was at 0.75% um, before the Bank of England cut rates pre-pandemic. So they'd only be restoring it back to where it was in January 2020. Nonetheless, what are we expecting for CPI? We saw 5.4% in December, up from 5.1% in November. And on the RPI measure, prices rose even faster, rising to 7.5%. So 7.5% RPI um, in December, got 7.5% 7 .5 US CPI in January, and the UK economy grew 7.5% in 2021. So the number of the week is 7.5%. Nonetheless, the most notable takeaway that I took from those December numbers was a sharp rise in food, non-alcoholic drinks, along with increases in the prices of clothing and household goods. So I think the supply chain disruptions we've been hearing about for several months are starting to filter down into the shops. Now, this is unlikely to be the end of it, given the Bank of England expects CPI to peak at 7.25%, probably in April, which is likely to push the RPI up to over 9%. Now, this week's January numbers are expected to see UK CPI coming in at 5.5% and core prices to rise to 4.3%. do not be surprised if that comes in higher, because we underestimated US CPI on, on Thursday this week. So it stands to reason that economists are potentially underestimating the impact of price rises coming through in the January numbers. So a strong number in January could mean the Bank of England, it, it probably wouldn't take much to tip the balance from four to five or six, voting for a 25 basis point rate hike in March. So looking at cable, we can see from these two converging lines here, that we've got decent resistance in and around 136.70. That trend line from the highs through here still remains fairly intact. We've also got the 200 day moving average. So the barrier for further sterling gains is quite significant when we look at this cable chart here. Having said that, you're basically trying to price the Bank of England against the Federal Reserve. And that's why you're getting this price compression. You've got the push pull of US and UK rates, obviously the UK economy, and the effect that potential rate rises could have on that. But overall, we're still pretty much in a fairly decent range, decent support 134.20, um, resistance up around 136. I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Oh, obviously, if we do get a breakout, then the breakout is likely to see us trade lower. Euro sterling, really solid support at 82.80. We can see that here going all the way back. That's a huge level. Um, we rallied really strongly in the wake of the Lagarde press conference last week, but we haven't been able to follow those gains through as the ECB have once again talked to the prospect of a rate hike or multiple rate hikes down. Now, that means that we could find significant support around about 83.70 on the um, euro sterling, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't trend lower. That does tend to be the line of least resistance when it comes to further euro sterling um, losses. But we still remain very much in the realms of sell the rally for euro sterling. So I still expect to see that start to creep back towards those lows that we saw back in January. Fed minutes. Um, let's look at the dollar index because that's going to be particularly interesting. And it's still very much a case of buy the dip um, when it comes to the dollar index. And I think the, the problem with this the problem with this week's Fed minutes is the fact that there's been an awful lot of chit chat, if you want to call it that, 
of the appetite amongst various Fed officials for the likelihood of a 50 basis points rate rise in March, as well as the prospect of a rise, an increase in rates at every single meeting. Markets are pricing six or seven rate hikes this year. So I'll be looking for the thinking of FOMC members on that with the caveat that obviously this was before um, the CPI reading that we saw um, earlier this week. So it's really difficult to gauge how much we can take from these latest Fed minutes, given the, given the data that we've seen since then, notably payrolls, which were really strong, um, with decent wage growth, and the CPI. Now, we do have US retail sales coming up, and it'll be very interesting to see whether or not um, that the end of year weakness that we saw in December translates into a new year rebound. US retail sales have been trending much better relative to retail sales here in the UK, simply because US consumers got an awful lot more fiscal help from the US government, and an awful lot of them, I think, are still living off that. That's not going to that's not going to last forever, but nonetheless, I think the U.S. economy is in a slightly better state. Say, for example, in terms of consumer spending than the U.K. one. So retail sales, we could see a rebound of 1.7%. Certainly, that's what markets are expecting. The bigger question is whether or not that's what we'll get, given the fact that consumer confidence remains so weak. But again, with consumer confidence and retail sales, what people say, how people say they feel is not really directly correlated with what they actually do. So I'm a little bit sceptical of, of um, the, the crossover between retail sales and consumer confidence. I don't think it's always an accurate benchmark when it comes to um, extrapolating one number from the other. In terms of earnings, we've got four companies which I've got my eye on. NatWest Group of, of the banking UK bank starts. So we've got NatWest is the first one to kick off UK bank's earnings season. And certainly we can see over the course of the past uh, few months how well the NatWest share price has done. But you also have to put that in the context of the fact that it hit record lows all the way back in 2020 in the aftermath of the lockdown. Certainly have been good ones for the NatWest share price. We have to go back an awful long way to see where we were pre-pandemic, and we're pretty much back to where we were um, at the end of 2019 and the uh, general election result that we saw um, mid-December 2019. So basically, we're back where we were just over two years ago. So um, four-year numbers for NetWest. We've seen a whole host of provisions, loan impairments recycled back onto the balance sheet, which has helped boost their profits. Net interest margins continue to struggle. They're not quite the weakest in the UK banking sector. HSBC's lagged behind, but they've fallen back um, in Q3 to 1.5% from 1.61%. But shareholders will be looking for management to follow through on the pledge to distribute a minimum of £1 billion per annum to shareholders from 2021 to 2023 by a combination of ordinary and special dividends. Now, obviously, that'll be good news for the UK government because their, their stake now sits at 52.96%. Um, they've reduced that ever so slightly over the course of the past 12 months. And the bank has also sold off its Irish loan book or is in the process of doing so to um, permanent TSB for 6.4 billion euros in December. Now, that deal is expected to take around about 12 months to complete. But nonetheless, um, the bank has also said it plans to buy back £750 million of its own shares in the second half of this year. So this year, this, this coming week's four-year numbers will certainly be interesting in terms of the payout for um, NatWest as it gets, it gets ready to report its full year numbers. So certainly in terms of the direction of travel for the share price, 
things look fairly positive, although a slowdown in the UK economy could impact on some of its lending patterns. But overall, um, they've been fairly positive. We've also got the latest numbers from Reckitt Ben Kaiser. Um, I think we, there's I think there's definitely a read across from Unilever uh, this week. They were a little bit disappointing. But one thing that I did take from the Unilever numbers was the fact that they have been able to improve their, or increase their prices without having seen a significant impact on their sales growth numbers. Now, on a like-for-like -like basis, nine-month revenues for Reckitt have seen a rise of 3.6%. So looking to see that sustained into Q4. Um, and there's also been chatter about a disposal of its infant formula business, which was said to be up for discussion as a result of pressure from shareholders over whether this business could be considered high margin enough. So we could see some further evolution on the thinking of that. This is the same business that they paid $17 billion for um, in 2017. Now they're looking to offload that business. They offloaded part of it already, the China business, for $2.2 billion in September. So that's quite a bit of a destruction of value when it comes to that. And that's sort of reflected in the share price that we've seen over the course of the past um, few months. But it is towards the lower end of its recent range. So I would imagine that the bar is quite low when it comes to Reckitt Ben Kaiser and uh, this, this week's full year numbers. We've also got the numbers from Walmart. Um, nothing really to speak of. Their costs are going to be the main issue there, as they have been for pretty much every other retailer. How much more money are they having to pay their staff? Um, how much is you know how much more is it costing them relative to sales? Certainly, Christmas period is the strongest period traditionally for retailers. But having said that, they have to imply an awful lot more staff. Um, and there are tougher comparative, comparatives, rather, if I can get my words out, from 2020. But profits are still expected to come in at a fairly healthy $1.50 uh, share. But there's the key support level there on Walmart shares, just below 136, 135. So keep an eye on that and keep an eye for any disappointment. And last but not least, NVIDIA. Um, done really, really well. Been a big winner from the uh, uh, chip shortage. Uh, also, um, it's pulled out of its deal to buy ARM. Um, not really a surprise that, to be quite honest. I mean, I, you know, we, we've seen that one coming for quite some time. Um, regulatory concerns and what have you. And we've got a nice little uptrend here. Um, so we remain solidly in that. And um, I think it's likely that um, we'll probably see another decent set of numbers and they've already seen a 55% rise in the sale of their new high spec chips for AI tasks. And they've also launched a new suite of chip products called the Omniverse, which is, which is expected to drive revenues in this area in the coming quarters. So expectations for this quarter, fourth quarter, are for revenues of $7.4 billion, plus or minus 2%, with gross margins of 65 to 67 percent so keep an eye on that support level the 200 day moving average there but expecting some fairly decent numbers from nvidia as we look ahead towards next week one other one other one other company that is reporting is also airbnb and uh, they will report they will be reporting their fourth quarter numbers on the 15th of february but that's it for the week ahead thank you very much for listening this is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets and have a great weekend.